Hello and welcome to our event today. I'm Dr. Shannon Nash. I'm the Network Manager at NADSEN, the North American and Arctic Defense and Security Network. And we'd like to welcome you to the event, Upcoming Greenlandic Election, Possible Impact on Sovereignty, Identity and Security. So thank you very much for joining us. And just a little bit about NADSEN. So we're a collaborative network and we provide timely, relevant and reliable expert advice on North American and Arctic defense and security topics. We address three core policy challenges, as well as many of the intersection points that run throughout these challenges and themes. So those include the defense role in the Arctic, NORAD modernization, the future of North American defense, and the evolving role of major powers in global strategic competition. And we'd like to invite you to visit us at nadsen.ca. There is a plethora of research uh, products, as well as videos. Uh, after this uh, event, we will also be posting this video for those to enjoy who aren't able to join us. And please also consider following us on Twitter because we do keep that updated with upcoming events as well as updates on products that we've produced. So I would like to now turn it over to the director of the Observatory on Politics and Security in the Arctic, uh, also known as OPSA, and one of our NADSEN members, Dr. Matthew Landreau, to introduce our esteemed panel. So thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Shannon, um, and thank you to, uh, to Nats and to, uh, for uh, coordinating this event with uh, OPSA. Um, just a bit to give a bit of a, a background on, on the conference, um, idea came up a month ago as the uh, election was called in, in, in Greenland to, to talk about this upcoming election uh, to be held in Greenland, uh, scheduled for April 6th. Um, so I think it, you know, there would be a better example in my mind of a territory in the Arctic region at the crossroads of so many um, structural dynamics, so many relevant phenomena that could apply to other parts of the Arctic. So we're thinking, you know, global warming. We're thinking of great power competition. We're thinking on a more domestic way to self determination. Uh, we're talking also about sustainable development or that fragile balance between the economy and the environment, right? So, um, so many issues, so many questions that could also apply to other jurisdictions in the Arctic region. Um, I think it's also a territory at the crossroads historically in terms of where to go next, in terms again of self-determination response to global warming and development in general. So it is my great pleasure to welcome and, and to thank for accepting the invitation, uh, Ufe Jacobson, which is an associate professor at the University of Copenhagen, um, specialized on Greenland-Denmark relationship, and Maria Akron, associate professor at the University of Greenland. So um, I'll ask uh, uh, Professor uh, Jacobson and Akron to, to go for about 10, 15 minutes, then talking about different aspects uh, about the possible impact of the upcoming election. And afterwards, uh, we'll open the floor uh, for you know, questions and answer. If you have questions top of mind, uh, make sure to uh, share them in the chat. So you can type your question in the chat or keep them in mind. And uh, we'll open the floor after the first two presentations. So without further ado, I'll turn to Professor Jacobson. Uh, to explain a bit, to analyze, to give us a bit of, of his insights on how this election fits in the broader context of the Denmark-Greenland relationship, but also the future of that relationship, where what kind of impact can we see maybe in the you know, short, medium, long-term future of, of this election? Professor Jacobson? Thank you so much for inviting me to present my ideas here. So as you said, uh, I will talk about uh, any possible impact on the upcoming Greenlandic uh, election on the Denmark-Greenland relationship. As probably most of you noticed, Greenland has attracted global interest when former President Trump in now August 2019 offered to buy Greenland. The Danish Prime Minister reacted by claiming that uh, Greenland is not for sale. The government of Greenland gave the situation a touch by coining the expression, we are not, we are open for business, but we are not for sale. When the Danish Prime Minister later, a little later visited Greenland, um, 
also still in August 2019, she told the Greenlandic press that Greenland is not Danish, Greenland belongs to Greenland, end of quote. However, there's uh, more to it, uh, to the constitutional status of Greenland than just so. And uh, the relationship, as I want to, to demonstrate, between Denmark and Greenland is part of the ongoing Greenland election campaign. But very briefly uh, about uh, the constitutional status of Greenland. Greenland is part of the Danish realm uh, that together with Denmark proper comprises the Fairy Islands in the North Atlantic and Greenland in the Arctic. Greenland has developed from being a Danish colony until 1953 actually, when Greenland as part of the UN initiated process of uh, decolonization after the end of the Second World War became integrated as a so-called equal part of Denmark. Later on in 1979, Greenland obtained home rule and in 2009, with the implementation of the Greenland Self-Government Act, the process of autonomy took a further step forward. So according to this uh, Self-Government Act from 2009, the people of Greenland was recognized as a people according to international law. And as such, Greenland obtained the right of self-determination or sovereignty if and when the people of Greenland decides that it wants to be independent from Denmark. The Self-Government Act allows the government of Greenland to initiate negotiations with the Danish government uh, on independence. If an agreement is actually reached between the two governments, and if that agreement is endorsed by a referendum in Greenland and obtains consent of the Greenlandic and the Danish parliament, Greenland can assume sovereignty over the Greenland territory. So of course, this is a very uh, a favorite position for me to a former colony or a part of a, 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 a bigger realm. But before formally becoming sovereign, Greenland can take over policy areas from Denmark and exercise legislative and executive power within these policy areas. However, as long as Greenland is not a sovereign state, it cannot formally take over the responsibility for the policy, for the following policy, six policy areas, the constitution, the Supreme Court, citizenship, currency and monetary policy, defense and security, and finally, uh, last but not least, uh, foreign policy. So these six policy areas remain the constitutional prerogative of the government of Denmark. However, it's also important to recognize that in practical terms, it is not that fine edged since Greenland actually do foreign policy in cases that only pertain to Greenland. So although opinion polls tell that majority, a majority of people in Greenland wants independence, they do not want to lose the annual subsidy of around 600 million uh, US dollars granted by the Danish government. This subsidy equals around 50% of the annual budget of the government of Greenland. Therefore, it's a guarantee of the current level of welfare services in Greenland that would not be possible without the Danish grant. So the first step in the process of full sovereignty of the people of Greenland is economic sustainability. The salient issues of the election campaign in Greenland, therefore, is how to enhance savings in the public expenses and how to increase the level of income. Today, fishery is the most important economic branch in Greenland, but the goal is to develop mining industries and tourism considerably in order to bring down unemployment and to increase the base of taxation in order to eventually 
remove the need for the annual subsidy from the Danish government. Nevertheless, during uh, every election campaign in Greenland, at least since the introduction of the Self-Government Act, independence has been an issue often brought into the public debate through Danish media. This is an impact of the election campaign that is essential to the relations between Greenland local government and the central government of Denmark. Denmark uses Greenland as a necessary condition for the Danish government's self-perception of being, and I quote, Arctic, an Arctic great power, even if Denmark is also a small country. According to the Danish Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Danish realm is centrally located in the Arctic, end of quotation. This gives the Danish government access to Arctic Council meetings and meetings in other Arctic fora and indirectly privileged access to Arctic big players like the US and Russia and other Arctic countries. Greenland has become central to the great power dynamics in the Arctic right now in a situation with increasing geopolitical tensions between the US, Russia and China. Since the speech of the Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, at the Arctic Council ministerial meeting in May 2019, Greenland is also a target for Chinese investments in uranium, rare earth, minerals, mining, etc. And these investments uh, are actually welcomed by the government of Greenland since it needs foreign in investment. Um, but since, and, and, that, and that way will, will contribute to the welfare of Greenland citizens and to the economic sustainability of Greenland. But they are also seen as a threat by the Danish government to the Danish government's possibilities of a close relationship with the US due to the great power rivalry between the US and China. However, Greenland is, as it were, the ticket for Denmark to the Arctic. Therefore, bluntly speaking, without Greenland, in case the endeavor for Greenlandic independence is successful, eventually Denmark would lose its ticket as a legitimate actor in Arctic policy. So as long as Greenland is continuing its way down the road to independence from Denmark, this is the biggest threat to Danish Arctic ambitions. In case of the independence of Greenland from Denmark, Denmark would be left without access to Arctic policy circles and close cooperation with Arctic great powers. This, I think, explains why the coverage by Danish media of election campaigns in Greenland is focusing on the issue of independence. Although election campaigns by Greenlandic political parties are primarily about everyday politics in Greenland. Independence, however, is also an issue in Greenlandic media during elections, but it's not a salient issue since there is an overwhelming agreement among uh, most political parties about independence. The differences are more an issue of what distant, of how um, that this distant goal is, how, how distant the goal is, sorry, and uh, how long it will take to obtain it. The salient issue in the election campaign is rather economic sustainability and how Greenland is supposed to reach that goal. goal which is often primarily seen as the precondition for political independence, although it's also seen as something good in, and by itself, of course. It seems as if the goal of political independence has gained a hegemonic status among most of the political parties in Greenland, leaving the opposition to the goal of political independence to few and minor political parties. Greenlandic parties, um, according to their stance as either pro-sovereignty or pro-association with Denmark. I will show you a table uh, over this. 
Is it working? Yes, it's working. That's, that's fine. Um, so we have a, a number of what I hear term pro-sovereignty parties. Uh, we have the, the biggest one, Siumut. Uh, it's a social democratic party, the word Siumut meaning forward. There's the second largest party, according to the election in 2018, Inuit Atsakatiyit, uh, or the community of the people. There is the Democratic or the Democrats. And there's a small part, a smaller party called Malarak, which means a uh, beacon in, in Greenlandic. And then there's a very small one, Nunata Ridonai, or, or the children of our country or the descendants of, the, of our land. So these are the, the, the pro-sovereignty uh, uh, parties. And then there are two very small parties. At the Sut, which is also an old party from the 1970s, but now very small and conservative. And then the uh, so-called cooperation party, which is only two, I think two or three years uh, old. So, so the, the, this, these are um, uh, the proportion between uh, pro and uh, against uh, sovereignty. Earlier, the pro-sovereignty political parties were more outspoken concerning the exact time for political independence. The chair, for instance, of the Siumut party said in 2013 that independence would occur in her lifetime. At that time, she was 45 years old. And the political party Nalarak even said that the independence in 2021, this year, was an achievable goal. Uh, and the party Nunat Ritonai said that independence would be possible immediately. <laughs> None of these ideas, of course, has made it. Um, but it does it um, uh, a number of ideas for taking over new policy areas from Denmark as part of the process of obtaining independence is mentioned in this ongoing election campaign. Um, the political party of Inuit Asarati Eat uh, is an example of the priority of everyday politics in the uh, election campaign. When asked, they underline that they are definitely a pro-sovereignty party, but that, but that the, uh, um, the why, the how, and when is not part of their election program because only when society's wheels are running at full pressure, as they lyrically terms it, we can discuss when we can become independent. Uh, so this is uh, showing that there is this uh, difference between in the between the, uh, the Danish press or media coverage of the election campaign and uh, how the uh, Greenlandic political parties is actually handling their own election campaign. That's it. Thank you very much for your attention. I will remove Thank my. You very Yes. My document again. Thank you very much uh, for Jacobson. They have many, many questions for you. And, and I, I encourage if uh, people in the, uh, in the room uh, listening have questions, type them in the chat or, or just remember them uh, to ask them at the end, uh, at the end of the presentation. I turn to Professor Mary Akron now. Um, I think uh, Uwe, you talked a bit about the great power competition, you know, relationship with the US, China, uh, also about mining. Um, turning to Professor Akron now to, to go a bit more in depth, to, to, to look at what would be the impact or possible impact on Greenland, if we can call it foreign policy, international relations, more generally speaking, because it's not just kind of state diplomacy, but it could be into para-diplomacy. So I turn to uh, Professor Akron. You, you are, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. thank you for, for having me as well. Um, since uh, Ufte was already covering some of the issues, I, I will uh, just go into more detail maybe around those. Um, so the two uh, kind of 
international relations uh, uh, questions that had have come up now in in the uh, in the local campaign uh, election campaign is about the economy of course the mining issue especially uh, the Kwanefjell or Kwanefjell project in southern Greenland where you have the rare earth elements and the uranium uh, extraction or possible extraction of, uh, of uranium which of course can be used for for dual use both uh, for civil and and military use and this is uh, something that divides both the population but also uh, the political parties so we have uh, three parties with, which are a little bit more in favor uh, simut has gone out. Uh, well, they are a little bit divided in in within the Simut party. Actually, uh, some of them, some of the politicians say they are in favor of of, uh, of the mining project. Others are saying, well, we have to wait and see uh, uh, when all these uh, environmental impact assessments uh, uh, have come through, and if if the project actually is in line with, uh, with the resource uh, or the mineral law uh, that Greenland has uh, and, and so forth. And, and that will then be in June uh, where, where this uh, uh, will be a, a made, uh, the decision will be made. Um, uh, Democrat is in favor uh, uh, and uh, Nunatak Tetornai are also in favor for, for this uh, project. Uh, those parties which are uh, uh, then against this project is Ia uh, Inuit Atakatigi, Nalarak, and Atasut. So there is a kind of a 50 50 division between the parties, but this is also in line with what the population uh, see if, if, if we look at. Uh, uh, the opinions polls that has been made and and we can also see that there has been a more increased uh, campaigns against uh, this project with uh, with the NGOs of or this movements of Urani, Namik and and other environmental organizations uh, which have uh, kind of voiced their their voices uh, a little bit more uh, during the campaign as well regarding this project. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, there is this uh, 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 relationship with the US um, uh, that has been a little bit uh, uh, kind of complicated in, in, in the past uh, regarding the Pitufik, the Thule Air Base. Uh, now there is a new agreement uh, with, the, with the US so uh, Greenland will actually, uh, uh, in, in the next period, uh, will take over uh, the, the contracts. There has been now an American company uh, which has been in charge with all the service contracts uh, regarding the base. Um, and according to the defense agreement between Greenland, uh, Denmark and, and the US, it's actually should be a, a Greenlandic or uh, a Danish company uh, dealing with these kind of issues. So in, in the next phase, uh, these contracts will be again uh, taken care of by probably a Danish Greenlandic uh, company. And this is, is kind of important. It's, it's maybe uh, kind of a symbolic importance, but also important for, for the income of, uh, uh, of some uh, Taxes and 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 incomes coming from from the base to to uh, to to the Greenlandic national um, uh, finances. Uh, another thing regarding uh, Greenland is, of course, its relationship with, with international organizations. And here we can see that Greenland actually have had en enhanced its capacities uh, throughout the years. Uh, of course, uh, ICC is one of the uh, most important organizations, the Inuit Circumpolar Council, where, where Greenland is, is acting on its own. It has its own headquarters here in, in Nook, together, of course, with the, with the Canadian uh, and, and others, which are part of the Arctic Council as well. Um, and, uh, and also within the Arctic Council itself, I mean, there has been uh, uh, 
discussions. Uh, uh, of course, it's underneath, uh, Greenland is acting underneath the delegation of Denmark, the Kingdom of Denmark. So there is uh, three representatives coming from the Kingdom, one from Denmark, one from Greenland, and one from, uh, from, from the Faroe Islands, which are then dividing the speeching time in, uh, in, within the Arctic Council. So uh, each representative have one minute each uh, of, of speak, speaking time uh, uh, during these uh, general assemblies. Uh, another thing uh, which I can just mention is that my, um, I and my colleague Rasmus Lander Nielsen here at, at uh, our university has done a, a recent uh, foreign and security opinion poll uh, together uh, with Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, who is Analyse and Manu Media. Uh, and we can see uh, this is a kind of first indication of uh, what the people actually think about uh, foreign and security policies issues. Uh, and one of the results is, of course, if, if you look at uh, the challenges and the threats that the people uh, can observe, of course, there has been a lot of debates around this great power relationships, the geopolitical uh, scene in the Arctic and how it changes uh, the dynamics uh, regarding uh, foreign and security policy. But this doesn't really border the population so much. It seems to be that the domestic and internal issues that actually uh, is more in the minds of, of the Greenlandic people. So it's more about unemployment, the higher living costs and uh, and the, the economic situation that that people are more concerned with, and climate change is coming on on fourth place. So, so it's not really uh, so much about uh, what the, the great powers are, are de dealing with. Uh, it's it's more uh, about what what uh, what the situation is on on a daily basis that that is most concerning uh, for for the people. Another uh, uh, result from this poll is that if you look at who Greenland would like to uh, cooperate more or less with, it, it, it's, it's very clear that uh, it is the neighboring country. Here we, we see Iceland, Canada, and also the Arctic Council as the most important uh, free uh, uh, cooperative uh, 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 stakeholders in, in, uh, in foreign and security policy or, or overall international cooperation. Uh, and of course, uh, there is also Denmark, US is coming a little bit later on, on, on this list, but, but it's, it's definitely uh, <clears throat> what Greenlanders would like to see is more cooperation with the neighboring countries, uh, especially then Iceland and, and, and Canada. Um, what should I continue with? I had some some small things. Uh, yeah, the independence issue was already covered by by Uffe in a great deal. Uh, <clears throat> so this is always uh, something that comes up in, in in the election campaigns, also in the local media,s of course, uh, and. Uh, it seems to be the kind of overall aim or goal or idea or vision, if you like, but it's not very clear what the political parties uh, actually, what kind of independence they are talking about and what kind of strategy uh, they actually want to have. Uh, and, and the time frame is also very uncertain. So, so that is, uh, but it's always a question that that comes up in 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 the election campaigns. Uh, yeah. Other than that, um, I think I will wait for the questions. Actually, I think that's <laughs> will be better. Thank you, Professor Akron, and and for sure we'll uh, open the floor if anybody has a, a question that they want to ask out loud. Uh, you can uh, click on the reaction button and then raise hand, and then I'll turn um, spotlight on you. Uh, if you have questions that you want to type in the chat, uh, you can do so as well. I have the chat open, so uh, uh, questions will be asked to uh, to our uh, to our panelists. 
I have a few questions to, to kind of kickstart uh, to kick the Q&A. Um, I'm only going to start with one each. Uh, this is a question in chat, but uh, I'm seeing uh, just for Professor Jacobson, um, I heard you talk about uh, fiscal sustainability, right? That uh, the government of Greenland is looking to increase revenues uh, and the like. I'm just wondering, uh, did the COVID-19, uh, we'll call it disruption, <laughs> had an impact on this? Did it make Greenland more dependent on uh, the central government or less? Uh, does it have an impact even in, in, the, in the election? Um, and for, for Professor Akron, um, I'm just wondering, because I, I also looked at the survey that you worked on with uh, uh, Professor Lender. Do we see political parties in line with what you saw in public opinion? In other words, do we see some of the preferences that we saw from the people reflected in political party stances? I know they don't maybe talk a great deal about foreign policy, but is it reflected in some way, shape, or form? Or, or is our political parties not really going the same direction as the people? Uh, maybe Ufe to, to start. To start. Yes. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> actually, uh, the COVID nineteen was uh, a, a big concern when uh, when the uh, pandemic started, because the uh, the, the um, uh, capacity in the uh, the Danish, in the Greenlandic uh, health system is low and in case of many with need of, of uh, very much treatment that would be a big problem I think they only have uh, like four emergency beds in the hospital in Nuuk and even less around uh, Greenland so people has to be evacuated to other countries Denmark, first of all, but also Iceland, if it's not possible to have more people sent to Denmark. So there was a big concern about the, the number of people got infected. But uh, actually, I think it's fair to say that Greenland did very well. The uh, result today is 31 infected, 31 cured, no dead, no uh, hospitalized people. So uh, by strictly regulating uh, the uh, intake of people from outside to Greenland, uh, the authorities actually managed to keep it yeah, close to non-existence that you see in uh, and at other countries. Of course, it has um, economic consequences as everywhere. Uh, Tourism is very hard, uh, badly stroken. No, no one is coming. All the, the cruise ships, they have postponed their visits in a year or even more. Uh, and uh, also the uh, general economic uh, activity has gone down because of that. Uh, within construction, for instance, uh, there's a low speed, but there is still something going on. Uh, now that the rebuilding uh, two airports with the longer runways uh, to uh, to be able to uh, to receive uh, transatlantic flights, and there's been the building of new hotels in the capital of New, and these have been empty since then. So there's a lot of uh, also spending on on uh, on money to uh, to uh, save the. Uh, uh, the, the industry from bankruptcy within the, the, the building sector, the construction sectors and other sectors. But uh, I think that I think it's fair to say and not most people in Greenland think so that uh, it's cheap uh, com com compared to what it actually could have have done. Um, and I, I, uh, I think I, it's, it's, it strikes me that uh, how um smart and even uh, how, how much capacity has been uh, used to stop the pandemic uh, from what is a very uh, comparatively small government and a small population they actually managed uh, also to keep the pandemic out of uh, small places with no uh, facilities uh, in, in in health services so uh, so that's uh, that's a success i would say
Thank you. Yes. Uh, Professor Akron, and my question was about uh, political parties. So do we see some of the findings, the observations you saw in, pub in the public opinion survey you did reflected in political parties um, in relation to foreign, foreign policy issues or international relations issues? Yes, yeah, so uh, when it comes to foreign policy issues and, and so on, it's it's kind of a salient issue uh, overall in the debates uh, when it comes to uh, what what the political parties uh, are debating about. It's usually uh, around domestic issues, but of course, fishery and, and the mining uh, and, and so on are uh, and cooperation with the US is usually coming up in one way or the other. Um, and some some of the results is quite in line, I would say, with, with what the political parties uh, um, also uh, are discussing. I mean, with this, uh, since there is no threats, they don't see the threats. It's it's about more the most domestic issues, internet, uh, and also with the cooperation. Uh, there is, uh, of course, an enhanced uh, interest of cooperating with Iceland and also Canada. We have seen this also. Uh, in in several uh, ways, uh, and and um, and also the the continuation with the the the, the current alliances with the NATO, uh, US, and 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 the Arctic Council, and so on, and, and all all this. So definitely, what what actually was a little bit of a surprise uh, in the poll, but this can also be. Uh, be because of the timing of the poll as well uh, was uh, regarding the relationships with the, the three uh, great powers with China, Russia and the US where, where most people were actually a little bit more reluctant to board um, uh, uh, US and Russia in, in, in this kind of question where, where we were we're asking if they had a clear standpoint on, on foreign and security policy towards the great powers, or if it would be good economic relationships that should be in focus uh, or, or don't know kind of thing. And what comes out of that was that uh, most people would like to have good economic relations with China, uh, but then uh, in, in relation to US and the Russian case, it was, more to have a clear standpoint uh, regarding the, the foreign policy and security policy. We have to remember the poll was made in, in November, December 2020. So this was during the end of the Trump administration. So it can have some impact on uh, what people then thought uh, during that time. But it's quite an interesting uh, and a little bit surprising uh, factor that that we saw at least in this poll uh, and since uh, there has been a, a, a kind of uh, from the political party side and the politicians uh, uh, side uh, more collaboration with the US since they they have reopening recently the the, the consulate here in in, in Nook, um, and and also with the this new signing of of the agreements and and so forth so, so that was a little bit of a uh, kind of a striking result in in that sense. For sure, thank you. And and maybe to to continue with with you, uh, Marie. I have first question uh, from Andre. Uh, can you elaborate a bit on on Greenland, uh, U.S., Russia, China relations? And I would say maybe the uh, the second question: What does Greenland want from the U.S., Russia, and China, if anything? So, what are the salient issues? in these different bilateral relations, probably probably the ones most of interest, like the Greenland-US relationship, the Greenland-China relationship. I think we, we talked with about, about mining, but can you, um, can you go a bit uh, further on, on these points? Yeah, if I start with the US-Greenlandic uh, uh, relationship. So this is of course, uh, have been a historical part uh, since since the defense agreement in the 1950s. So uh, this is nothing new. It's, it's a, a kind of a traditional uh, 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 strategic, there is a strategic interest from the US side, of course, uh, and, and maybe a more economic uh, interest from the Greenlandic side, 
to, ha to have uh, the Pitipik air base in, in the northern part of, uh, of Greenland. Um, and also to have close relationship with, uh, with Washington uh, 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 regarding uh, also business uh, and trade uh, uh, and the educational uh, purposes and so on. So, so this, is, uh, this is kind of part of the package uh, in, in a sense uh, between the US and, and Greenlandic relations. Regarding China, it's more of economic interests, of course, with the mining projects where, where we have Chinese investors um, investing in, in these projects. China was also interested to invest in, in some of the airport infrastructure projects, but then Denmark uh, came along and, and come with, came with some money instead. Uh, and China has also tried to, to develop uh, other things uh, here in Greenland, but uh, but there is a kind of a, a little bit of a skepticism also towards uh, Chinese uh, investments and uh, and China's role overall in in the Arctic. So so of course, uh, even though the politicians are, are saying they are open for business and and they uh, are welcoming everyone. Uh, 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 there is still a, a, a little bit of a, also a hesitation uh, in, in towards the Chinese regime, of course. Uh, with the Russian case, there is not so much uh, discussion with, with uh, other than that there was a, a small media uh, thing from the Danish media about this honorary council, but that was a kind of a misunderstanding because a, a honorary council is just a, a local person who becomes appointed and uh, takes some uh, practical tasks uh, for Russian tourists and, and uh, what else uh, that, that needs to be done. Uh, so, so Russia is not really uh, much debated in, in, in the Greenlandic discussions. And, uh, and it's, there is, of course, the, the fishery agreements between Russia and Greenland. Uh, which is of importance, but but that's this kind of bilateral uh, agreements uh, within fishery with other countries uh, are are of course uh, because of of the huge uh, market uh, and uh, and Greenland's uh, uh, major export, as as Uffe was saying, is is about fishery. So. So this is of course relevant for the economy, but it, there is not uh, so much else going on with 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 uh, with Russia. Thank you, and I'll, I'll direct one of the questions in the chat to to Ufe, um, uh, and I don't know if you can speak about that aspect particularly. But um, question is, what about the issue of local democracy after the municipalities merging in two thousand and nine and twenty eighteen? Is that a central issue for the election? It seems of central interest on the East Coast. So um, maybe is there some more local dynamics at play or, or <laughs> rather than in the whole of Greenland? So we talked about the mining project in the South and East or the differing opinions depending on the region. Well, well <clears throat> I think it's fair to say that there is a kind of a perceived democracy, democracy problem. Uh, Greenland went from uh, 18 municipalities to, to four in 2008, and now it's uh, five, but still the, they, these are very big territories, bigger than uh, France, for instance, the northern municipalities are bigger, bigger size than, than the whole of France. And now um, the, the parties, uh, the now the Rock is talking about uh, having smaller entities to to enhance the, the level of uh, democratic discussions. Um, we will see uh, even in even small in Greenlandic uh, framework is big, so uh, there has to be I think specific um, uh, measures to. Uh, to, to help the communication between these uh, remote places. The internet uh, in some, in, in most of Greenland is working well, 
We have uh, cable connections to Canada and to Iceland uh, on the west coast and on the southern coast. But in the north and in the east, uh, this is more difficult. Um, where it works, um, it's actually used uh, actively as a, a, a democracy device, either by uh, online uh, referendums, uh, as chat. Uh, and so I think Greenland is known as the, 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 the place in the world with the most Facebook uh, accounts. And so there's very active communication between people and also that all quite kind of groups uh, is working. But um, it is very difficult to have a physically working uh, democracy in, in, in the remote places. Um, but of course, um, a smaller size would be, uh, I think, an advantage. Uh, the, the municipality with the capital of Nuuk is uh, actually uh, going from the western coast of Greenland to the eastern coast of Greenland. This is done for economic reasons because there would not be a base uh, for taxation in on the east coast. So therefore, the the capital of Nuuk is in a way transferring money or paying some of the expenses also on the east coast. And now there is a, a, a proposal to make as a, a specific east coast municipality. Uh, that's a good idea for the discussion, but it's a bad idea for the economy of the municipality that has to be transferred from other municipalities in ways. So, so um, the uh, the reform making those four big municipalities, I think, was a failure. And uh, there's been dif different uh, activities to to kind of uh, of cure that situation again. Uh, either by having smaller uh, uh, meetings uh, in, in smaller uh, fora, or by using the, as I said, the internet for, for, for referendums and, and discussions. Interesting to see how it, how it progresses. Uh, one question, one more question in the chat. This one's for Dr. Akron. Uh, you noted that Greenland wants to work more uh, towards more cooperation with Canada and Iceland. Do you foresee any tension or complication in this cooperation regarding different opinions of the operation of China or Russia, for example, in Greenland? Maybe a bit that uh, Canada, for example, has adopted uh, recently kind of a tougher stance on China and Russia as also uh, not allow for some Chinese companies to buy uh, Canadian interest in the Canadian North. Yeah, talk about would it have an impact on I don't know, the Canada Greenland relationship to have uh, that Greenland have more cooperation with China or, or, or not? If Kathleen, I get the <laughs> I, I, I will try to answer. Well, uh, I don't think uh, there will, would be any, well, it depends, of course, on the Canadian view, but. I would say from a Greenlandic point of view, it, it wouldn't have any impact uh, since uh, Greenland would, would have bilateral uh, agreements with Canada anyway. Uh, and uh, this is also something Greenland has with, with some, uh, with Nunavut, for instance, uh, this kind of memorandum of understanding and, and so forth. Um, so, uh, I think it would be more of a question from the Canadian perspective if if uh, uh, if then Canada would be be likely to cooperate with with, uh, with this more open minded Greenland in in that sense uh, uh, since Gr Greenland is is uh, a little bit more open to Chinese investments. Um, uh, with Iceland, there is a uh, very close uh, cooperation already in place, uh, especially in trade and shipping. Um, uh, and uh, so we do have a lot of Icelandic products in, in, in our local stores here in, in, in Greenland. Uh, and, uh, and there is also, of course, uh, a consulate here in, in Nook, uh, every, uh, an Icelandic consulate, and we have a representation in, in Reykjavik as well from the Greenlandic government. 
So, so there is very close ties and, and we also have a lot of uh, collaboration also uh, between the universities in, in Iceland and, and us here at Ilisima to Um So I think those relationships will also continue uh, as they are. For sure. And yes, probably a, a good question from the Canadian <laughs> standpoint to see if the bilateral relation would continue, probably would. Um, I don't think any other question I would, uh, I would aid it by if I, if I didn't ask this question to, to Ufe especially, but Mir, you can, you can also jump in if you have a few elements. Uh, I'm living in Quebec, so we have a sort of an history of talking about self-determination and, and, ind and independence. Um, a perennial debate when we talk about self-determination is uh, whether political parties and decision makers think that uh, the incremental step position, so to go step by step would be better, so to go and take over one jurisdiction after the other, <laughs> up to the point that you're completely sovereign and independent, or do you go for more the declaratory uh, position and you declare independence all at once. Well, all at once now for Greenland, they, they still have quite a bit of competencies. But uh, what do you think is the most likely scenario? Looking at what how the electoral campaign unfolded, but also the kind of immediate past and, 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 and the present um, of the self determination Greenland. Um. It's it's it's, uh, it's it's a very it's a very good question. I think it's also the the the, the answer has to be uh, com complex at least. Um, uh, already back in 1979, when home rule was obtained in Greenland, uh, the most important policy areas like uh, the school system, the museums, etc were taken over or taking, taken home, at his, as uh, Greenlanders put it, um, because that was uh, a, a, a very important part of the nation building process going on. Uh, as the last one, last bigger policy area is, is actually uh, natural resources. That was a big fight back in the 70s and 60s, 70s and 90s with Denmark. Denmark wanted to stick to the right for the natural resources in Greenland. And only after the year 2000, they gave up that idea. And with the, uh, uh, the Self-Government Act of 2009, uh, with this uh, I, uh, the, the uh, granting um, the, the status of a, a people, it was obvious that you cannot be a people of your own country without having it. Uh, the ownership for the natural resources. So this was the like the the last brick that was fall fall that the fall there. But since then, nothing has really happened. And uh, it turned out that even if Greenland had taken over the natural resources, when uranium became an issue, the Danish government said, uh, "Well, uranium is a military question." since there's international regulation on the export and so on. And the government of Greenland says, says nothing about uh, uranium, specifically uh, uranium in, in the uh, uh, act on, on the, the natural resources. So we have the right to decide over any natural resources in Greenland. And it's just an indication that uh, the real world does not neatly divide into uh, policy areas. But you will have a uh, defense policy within a natural resource policy, same uh, activity or project, but two different uh, uh, judiciaries, so to say. And it took two more than two years for the two governments to agree that uh, the government agreed and could decide whether to produce uranium and the government Denmark could decide whether to export it. So now they have to cooperate between these two questions. Uh, and, uh, and we have several more of these uh, clashes between different uh, policy uh, areas. 
So uh, a clean cut would be maybe more effective, but also more difficult to handle. And maybe you would have to pay for a lot that you're not really interested in. If you're really interested in, in the, the nation building process, you will, you will pay to administer the museums, but not more expensive areas as uh, different things that now the, the defense of Greenland, for example, this is an, an uh, expense from, from the Danish uh, government of the Danish uh, taxpayers in the end. Um, so, so Denmark is uh, still paying uh, the, the yearly, the annual um, uh, subsidy and a lot of expenses for military forces in, in Greenland and many other things. So that, this is not any clear advice. <laughs> I think you should see the, the problems in both cases. Right. Uh, I was expecting an easy, an easy solution. <laughs> Those are always pros and cons and trade-offs. That's what that's what we we teach oh, for the for the most part. Um, uh, seeing a last question in the chat, I'm, I'm seeing that we're also running out of time. So uh, maybe if, if uh, maybe for Maria, we're, we're not too sure. The question is about whether a bottom-up approach would be preferable to a top-down approach or if both could kind of coexist at the same time. Um, um, so this is a question from, from Michelle, how should they be balanced? How should we balance between uh, more of a bottom-up approach to answer regional needs and improve the security and quality of life uh, for northern communities? And uh, with topics that are maybe more top down, which is, you know, foreign policy, we talked about defense, we talk about military issues that are more top down, how to balance these two consideration in the Greenlandic uh, context. Do you know, Ufe or, or Maria? Well, maybe I can start. Um... <laughs> <laughs> I think we, we have both processes <laughs> at the same time, actually. In, in a way, we have uh, the central government, of course, the official government of, of Greenland uh, dealing with the, the kind of uh, overall guidelines and, and rules and regulations uh, for most uh, competence areas here in Greenland. And, and also you have then uh, the municipalities working maybe more from bottom up perspectives uh, but the problem, as I see it, is that there are some uh, some clashes between municipality levels and, and the, the central level sometimes. And this is also something we can relate to, to the mining projects, actually, uh, in, in southern Greenland, for instance. Uh, when I visited uh, southern Greenland a couple of years ago and, and discussed with, with, uh, with the municipalities uh, people there, they said that they don't get all the information that they need uh, uh, from the central government. And, uh, and, and this is, uh, of course, there seems to be some kind of lack of, uh, of information or com communication between uh, the different authorities. Um, uh, so sometimes uh, uh, there might be that it doesn't really work uh, Maybe it works from top down level, but not from bottom up uh, and, and vice versa, uh, depending on the context. Um, but yeah, I think the both both processes are uh, are kind of simultaneously at work, but maybe there are some frictions between between those. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I would like to thank Professor uh, Akron and, and Professor Jacobson. We're out of time. Uh, thank you for, for sharing your insights uh, with us. That was uh, really informative, a fascinating election, but also a fascinating case study. Uh, so many important questions and so many debates that could apply to other jurisdictions, not just in the Arctic region, to be honest, and <laughs> in other parts of the world as well. Thank you very much. And I'd like also to thank our, uh, our audience. Uh, thank you for your, your extremely relevant the pinpoint question. Uh, thank you for, for, for your participation as well. Shannon? 
Great, thank you very much. And I just want to reiterate uh, my thanks. So thank you, uh, Dr. Jackson and Dr. Akron, and as well as Dr. Landrio for your expert uh, moderating. And thank you so much for sharing all of your insights uh, to the panel. That's really, really great. And we really appreciate it. And I also want to thank OPSA for partnering with us for this event. Thank you, OPSA. Um, we really appreciate uh, appreciate your partnerships. And you can also, um, you can please sign up to, for our mailing list at Natsen if you'd like to be engaged with upcoming events, as well as uh, we will let you know when this video is posted, um, if you would like to rewatch or pass it along to your own network. And uh, thank you again for joining us. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to myself. Um, and again, our, our mailing list is on our website and also our Twitter is there. So thank you again, and I'm wishing you all a wonderful day. Thank you.